You want to see something neat? When I say the word subscribe, the little subscription button lights up. Subscribe. I'm going to be so pissed off if they remove that feature before this is uploaded. Before I jump right into Sparkster, I figured the best course of action was to start from the beginning, so I fired up some Rocket Knight adventures in preparation, in case there was some lore or something I needed to experience prior to Sparkster. You're not really missing much in terms of plot. It's a little story about saving the world from an intergalactic evil, and it may be infringing on the plot of Star Wars a tiny bit. There's a literal Death Star and a princess kidnapping, let's be real here, but Rocket Knight is a pretty awesome game that you should totally play. A high recommendation. Plays great, Looks and sounds awesome with a bunch of cool Genesis effects going on. The presentation is damn good here. And the most important thing I should mention, this game will beat the living shit out of you too. Rocket Knight fools you with this cartoony aesthetic and cute animal characters, but goddamn, this game shows no mercy. A good litmus test for how hard a game is going to be is by looking in the options menu and seeing a children's or a child's play difficulty setting. I've come to learn that this is the biggest red flag in gaming. Now let's take a look at the Japanese version of Rocket Knight Adventures. Only two difficulty settings. Normal and Hard. Don't think for a second that Konami made the game easier for Americans. The exact opposite, actually. They just renamed their difficulty settings. Children's is Japanese Normal. Easy is Japanese Hard. Normal and Hard in America is Very Hard and Crazy Hard in Japan, respectively. And you'd have to beat the Japanese version on Hard to unlock Very Hard. And so on. It's fucking Streets of Rage 3 all over again. How Western versions of games tend to be more difficult than the Eastern versions. This seems to happen more in retro Konami games. There's a valid reason for all the difficulty changes. It's rumored that video game rentals are the culprit. Back in the day, you would rent a video game because it was cheaper, and you didn't have to commit to a game if it sucked. You would rent it, beat it in a week or less, then return the game, and repeat the cycle all over again. All these Japanese game developers saw this and said, let's make our game so fucking hard that they couldn't be beaten in a week, and they would have no choice but to pay full price for it. Maybe those weren't the exact words, but you get the idea. If there's even a small, insignificant chance for a AAA gaming company to make slightly more money, you know damn sure they're going to take advantage of it. It's not illegal to rent media in Japan, but most video game publishers will raise hell about it. And guess which one was against it the most? Yep, Nintendo. They even went as far as suing Blockbuster because Congress wouldn't let them have their way. This is the same country that lets you rent a girlfriend. But video games? That's a paddling. But this is all beyond the realm of this video. Censored Gaming has a great video about Japan and game rentals. Definitely worth a watch. And that's why Contra has no health bar in America. That's why Rocket Knight's difficulty is all fucked up. That's why Streets of Rage 3 is a pain in the ass. And that's why The Lion King is one of the hardest video games ever made. Because of course Disney would join any bandwagon for money. Disney and Greed go together like family vloggers and child abuse. I'm sure each gaming company has their own reasons for regional difficulty changes. Some Japanese developers thought Western gamers wanted harder games. Or they probably just hate us. And there are cases where the Japanese versions of games were harder than the North American. Final Fantasy 2, or 4, is a prime example. Sparkster also suffers from North American difficulty changes as well. We'll get to that soon. Sparkster is one of those rare and interesting cases where it was available on two different consoles, the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis, but the two versions would be completely different games. Genesis Sparkster was the one I played first. I figured that because the last game was a Genesis game, this would be a proper sequel. It was titled Rocket Knight Adventures 2. It came out a week after the Super Nintendo Sparkster was released in Japan. September 15th for the Super Famicom, September 23rd for the Mega Drive. This game is not a port but a completely different game altogether. New levels and new bosses, with Sparky getting an updated design. He was given some more attitude, as a means to reflect the 90s attitude that mascots have adopted due to the rise of Sonic the Hedgehog's popularity. Sparky isn't going to ride around on a skateboard and tell people to recycle. To the extreme! But he did lose some of his original cuteness and got himself a new haircut. Gone is his stoic demeanor, as a more confident possum takes his place. There were also some changes to the mechanics as well. The boost meter is still around, but now it fills up on its own. Before you had to hold the attack button and charge the meter to do a dash attack. Now it has its own dedicated button. 
It also has a leveled up charge that allows you to do a screw attack. But not the cool one that Samus uses. Or Plock. Or Kevin McAllister. An actual screw attack that actually screws. Or unscrews. Actual screws. Whether you think hanging back and waiting for your moment to strike is a better strategy, or getting in their face and hacking away, is on you. But I do prefer the dash attack over the normal. It's a very short sword, so you need to get right in the enemy's face to hit them. A little too close. You do get a bunch of invincibility frames when you attack, though. Like the game is encouraging you to fill your blade with the rage of the gods. Let the rage of the gods drive your blades! He used to have a projectile, but they must have removed it for some reason. Super Nintendo Sparkster gets to keep his projectile. What the fuck? And you'll find some rocket packs all over the place. There's also a sword power-up similar to Revenge of Shinobi. Because God knows I don't reference that game enough. It works in the same way. Buffs your damage, lost after one hit. And you get your usual video game fare like food for health, extra life heads, and these gems. The gems are getting their own paragraph. Because I have some grievances. Genesis Sparkster comes with a new roulette system at the top of the screen. When you collect 10 gems, it sets off the roulette. Blue gems are worth 1, red gems are worth 10. You can get a wide variety of power-ups like bombs, more bombs, and of course, even more bombs. I'm playing this on normal, and no matter what I do, or how many gems I collect, the damn roulette keeps giving me bombs. This was a pain in the ass to deal with. It can mess up your gameplay. Who the fuck makes collectibles that hurt you? Who thought this was a good idea? I think I saw maybe one apple come out of this thing on normal, but I needed to be on the brink of death for it to appear. It got to a point where I decided to start avoiding gems because I didn't want to put up with any more of this bullshit. You devs should be grateful that Konami kept your names a secret because I would have sent snipers to find you bastards. I'm thinking that if I play it on easy, the game will be more forgiving. And it is. I actually get to see actual power-ups. But easy mode cuts the level short. Entire sections and mini-bosses were cut out, so easy mode is out of the question for a flea pit survivor like myself. Then it occurred to me. I was playing the North American version of Sparkster. And I just went on a whole TED talk about how North American versions of games were harder. Specifically Konami games. So I booted up the Japanese version of Sparkster. And what do you know? Normal mode is way more forgiving. The roulette actually helps me. I got an extra life once. This is great. When I bump the Japanese difficulty up, then we see the roulette become the bomb-toting bastard that ruined a thousand speedruns. So Sparkster also suffers from the same problem that Rocket Knight had. They fucked the difficulty up for us Americans. So North American Normal was Japanese hard this whole time. So avoid the North American version like the plague, and stick to the Japanese version. It's not like you're gonna need a translation patch to figure out the plot, so go nuts. Once again you play as Sparkster. No shit, I know. He's this possum who's not only a Rocket Knight, but the best damn Rocket Knight in existence. What is a Rocket Knight exactly? You get a jetpack and a sword. You know the rest. Raised and trained by a former Rocket Knight Mifune Sanjolo, Sparky is an orphan who becomes an outlaw who fights for justice. He's one of the bravest possums in the known world. I know this because a regular possum would play dead as a defense mechanism. Possums aren't brave, hedgehogs don't run as fast as you think, and bandicoots may be stupid but they don't wear jorts. Sorry to shatter your childhood. Ten years before the events of Rocket Knight Adventures, another Rocket Knight by the name of Axel Gear disabled Sparkster's master Mifune. And to say this pissed off Sparkster would be a huge understatement. I don't exactly know what they meant by disabled. Is that supposed to be killed but they couldn't use the word killed? Disabled makes it sound like Axel paralyzed Mifune after he performed a botched pile driver on him at SummerSlam or something. Some sources say disabled, others say destroyed or severely injured. Help me out here! In the last game, you rescued Princess Sherry from the Emperor Devil Gus Devo Tindos. I probably pronounced that horribly wrong and I really don't give a shit. And his army of pigs and ancient robots. Saving the land of Elhorn and the enchanted kingdom of Zebulus. Now you must rescue the princess's cousin Cherry from the evil King Gadal. King Gadal isn't playing around. He conquered Emperor Diva Tindos's empire, kidnaps the princess, and orders his troops to destroy Sparkster in case he decides to rebel against him. Spoiler alert, he rebelled against him. Sparkster also had a short comic in the Sonic the Comic Books in 1995, supposedly a spin-off story of the second game called Last of the Rocket Knights. 
Unfortunately, the story was discontinued because Fleetway didn't renew the publishing license for Rocket Knight. That's not even the worst part. There's a bunch of fan art of Sonic and Tails and diapers. I've spent enough time in the Sonic fandom to know that this is far from the worst thing the Sonic fandom is capable of. There are some images from the cancelled parts floating around, all uploaded by the original artist Keith Page. Check the description. So now that we've got some of the lore out of the way, how is the actual game? Before we jump into level 1, I just want to say that this game starts off right, with a boxing match between two giant mechs. No explanation for anything, just shut up and fight. And you want to win this fight, it's going to be important for later. There really isn't much to say about level 1, it's your basic introduction level. It does lock the screen until you fight these dudes in these vehicles, and the first game does something similar, but this time it has creepy faces on these pillars for no reason. After this section, you transition to a huge pile of ruins with these cylinders everywhere. And it's about as slow, and as tedious, as you can imagine. I feel myself getting older waiting for this thing to stop spinning. It's even more fun when the screw doesn't appear and you have to wait even longer. There are different paths you can take, but you still have to unscrew these things no matter what. Then we transition deep into the woods, put up with these pink things that drain your boost meter, and fight a tree face with some arms. Because even nature wants this possum dead. Boost into his face a bunch of times and what do you win? Another boss fight, but this time with help from your woodland friends. Don't forget to meet at the upper corner of the boss room. A blessing from the gods. So after thrusting into this dude and escaping through the hole in the wall, I had to pause the game for a second. I realized that I've been playing the first level this whole time, and it still isn't over yet. Hardcore was full of these encounters, but the levels in that game were much shorter and so were the fights. Same with Rocket Knight. Rocket Knight kept it interesting with a flying section and a much shorter scrolling section. But in Sparkster, three different areas, a giant cylinder, and two bosses. Now we're on a scrolling train section. And it's so... damn... slow. But I do dig the enemies coming from the background. They did that in Hardcore as well and I loved it. So when you finally get to the actual boss of the level after maybe 15 or 20 minutes of gameplay, it's this Metal Gear that flails its arm around. I'm not gonna lie, this boss sucks. What you're supposed to do is hit the boss on its nose. Guess a ray dome on the side would have been too obvious. It sounds simple enough, but you can't really stay on the ground because the mech arms hit you no matter where you stand. And it shoots projectiles too. So you have to abuse Sparkster's dash and fly in the air until his arms slow down and his weak spot can be hit again. And he takes a bunch of hits to kill. I found the method that works best is to angle your dash in a way that makes you bounce up so you can avoid the arm slapping you after you get a hit. And you can stay in the air forever because the dash meter fills up stupid fast in this game. But so far, the first level hasn't left the best impression on me. Not a terrible level by any means, but definitely bloated. They put the brakes on you for a good portion of the level when Sparkster's gameplay should be much more fast paced. You don't give a possum a jetpack and design a cramped scrolling section around him. Maybe the next level will be more open. I was wrong. Next is the Pyramid. And for some reason, the Super Nintendo has a Pyramid level too. I like to imagine that somewhere in the background, Mario is fighting the Angry Sun, or Cyrax is buried somewhere. They can totally be the same universe, shut up. This level brings up an issue I have with Sparkster. Not so much a problem in my opinion, but the thrusters allow you to cheese some of these levels. Most of you have played Super Mario World. Once you got the feather, you knew exactly what to do with it. But Konami is one step ahead. A big-ass tornado stops you, because fuck you, you're going in the pyramid. And the pyramid is a cramped level full of Indiana Jones boulders, spikes, and candle shenanigans. Don't forget the secret sword while you're in here. Fly up the side here, then haul ass without getting crushed to death. Do this about 10 times, game over twice, then throw your controller into the pit of Mount Etna out of frustration. Okay, maybe I went a little overboard, but once you finally get to the end of this room, grab the flashing sword. There's seven of them throughout the game to collect. This is the new thing that Sparkster brings to the table. They're just like the Chaos Emeralds, except you don't have to do the most boring special stage known to man to get them. There's one in each level. There's one right at the opening of the game after the robot boxing. They don't do anything until after the last one is collected, which happens to be right before the final boss. They give you a gold armor, because the similarities to Sonic don't ever stop. Even though the seven Chaos Emeralds could be interpreted as a reference to the seven Dragon Balls, and Sonic turning Super Saiyan is not a coincidence. 
Oh, to be a fly on the wall during that copyright case. Aside from the gold armor, you get buff damage as well, which makes the final boss much easier. It just sucks that you don't get to use this power until the game is almost over. Does it change the ending? Well, it does actually. He gets a little cutscene at the end with the king and the princesses, and an after credits scene where he puts the sword back in its place. You won't get this cutscene without the gold armor. Wait, Princess Cherry isn't with him in the last cutscene. Did he just leave her to die in that castle? What a prick. So I guess Cherry's life depends on you getting these swords too. The second level also has another boss that requires you to boost into his face. This one is easier to manage than his green brother. His arms made it challenging to hit his face consistently. What kind of pyramid is this? It's got lava everywhere and fire monsters. There's a whole bunch of gears and machinery everywhere. Planet Elhorn was centuries ahead of those stupid Egyptians. You invented a writing system and revolutionized agriculture? That's adorable. Elhorn's pyramids were more complicated than smartphones. The boss at the end is way better than the boss of the last level. Avoid his tail because it takes up a lot of valuable real estate. And that grab that comes out of left field. Or else he will yeet your ass into the sun. <laughs> level 3 is a big airship that is for the most part, a Swiss army knife of bullshit. You're supposed to go through these holes, pop out another side of the ship, and break these propellers. Sounds simple enough, but fuck if I know which hole goes where. You go out one hole, then go back into it, and you wind up in a different part of the ship. Like, how is Gadol's army supposed to even find their own way around this bitch? It gets worse when there's one propeller left, and you have no idea which hole sends you where. It can't get much worse than that, right? You get bonked by a hammer without any warning. You just have to know there's a cheap shot waiting for you. And the ship drops bombs constantly. It's bad enough the roulette wheel's against me, now I gotta be double teamed by that and the airship as well. The bombs are dialed way back in the Japanese normal because everything is dialed back in the Japanese normal. If I have to give one positive about this level, is that the ground actually gets destroyed over time. And there's fruit underneath. I like to think that this is the top of the pyramid from the last level. That would make for some fine level continuity. And when you destroy the propellers, you go inside the ruined ship, which is yet another long as fuck scrolling level. But level three is where Sparkster shows its biggest strength. The enemies. The way they interact with the world around them. The way they panic when the airship gets wrecked. The kind of charm and personality that many games, even today, could greatly benefit from. I take this over the ones that just walk from left to right and do nothing. Or the ones that just stay still and snipe you before you can react. You would think the cheap shot would piss me off, but no. It's the fact that I gotta start at the beginning of the ship again. And if you get a game over, you start outside the ship. Start living it now with laser scope from Konami. More power than you ever imagined. I don't know. I feel like there's a right way to do scrolling levels and a wrong way to do them. Or maybe I'm just biased against scrolling levels. There's just not enough on screen to keep me interested and I find myself just killing time until something shows up. It reminds me of that one line from Bruce Almighty. All this horsepower and no room to gallop! Why do I have this thick jetpack if I can't go anywhere with it? I don't get why these levels couldn't scroll normally. They'd probably be better levels if they could. Rocket Knight had what I felt like was a better scrolling section. Not by much, but at least it was more engaging. So once you get past the scrolling section, it's time for the boss. King Gadol has this army of ninjas at his disposal, and their leader, Paley. Avoid his shrink ninjutsu or you're screwed. And this is the one attack he spams the most. He's invincible for most of the fight. The only time you can hit him is when he divides himself and becomes small. Hit the one glowing dude then chase his ass until he dies. And of course, he drops bombs on you. Because everything in this game does. I would be more surprised if he didn't at this point. This game also has the shinobi problem where everything explodes when they die. Like they have hydrogen for blood or something. I'm not complaining. There isn't much to say. Get in your robot and start punching and stepping on shit. This right here is the thing I associate with Rocket Knight. Not the jetpack or the sword. The giant Evangelion boxing. I hope Konami promoted the man who pitched the idea of possums and robots instead of demoting him to pachinko maintenance. The real possibility that it could happen is what scares me the most. 
Our old friend the Possum Disabler is back again. He bombards you with explosives. If I have to talk about bombs one more fucking time in this video. Afterwards, we get a rematch of the boxing fight from the last game. Or the one from 30 minutes ago. Beat his ass so you can get to the next level. And maybe some bragging rights. You have a block button now, and you can either do a straight punch or a slower but more powerful uppercut. But one problem I had with Rocket Knight, and still with this game, is that there's no health bar for Axel during these fights, or any indication he's getting low on health. And he takes a lot of punches before he goes down. And is it just me, or is this fight much easier than the last one? Block his shot, walk forward, then uppercut him. Repeat until dead. It's like he forgot how to box. He does get aggressive sometimes, so you can't just button mash to win. And there's no magic sword in this level either. Now if you thought the first level was long, you will have to clear your schedule. Because level 5 never ends. Four of these doors with faces that shoot you, a bunch of cylinders that can crush you, and two giant robot bosses. This is the last stop before the finale of Sparkster, and they do not want you to win. The R-Type bosses. That's what they're called, and I sure hope none of Irem's lawyers are subscribed to me. But it is nice that each one has its own patterns and attacks. One will spam lightning that you need to jump over, and another will spawn enemies. Some of them are challenging. Except this one. He's probably still in beta development. In this level, there's actually two swords here to collect. One is given to you after you beat the bosses, and one before that where you have to dash through this laser section, go into this wall, and there it is. The laser section is not the hardest part of the level. It's the bullshit with the missiles and crosshairs. If you're not fast enough to clear this section, you are going to have a very bad time. These barrels suck. They serve no purpose other than making these levels even longer. Did I say it was the hardest part of the level? It's more like the hardest part of the entire fucking game. And this is the experience I had with most of Sparkster. Non-stop barrages coming from every direction. I'm not sure who wants this possum dead first, King Gadol or Konami's development team. You know what this level is really missing to make it truly complete? Medusa heads. Never mind, it's got those too. Maybe not Gorgons, but Cyborg Reptile Heads. And I hate these doors. Hit the head, wait for your meter to charge, then dash into another one because you can't reach it otherwise. After you get past the cylinders, you're at the home stretch. A bunch of tall robots stand in your way. And after you clear the giant robots, what do you win? Another giant robot. This is the boss of level 5, a yellow bullet spamming robot. And when you kill him, what do you win? Yet another giant... To say he's more unique than the last robot is a bit of an understatement. Arms folded while he dashes around on his head while his legs spin like helicopter blades. They just don't make him like they used to anymore. He's programmed to be a gentleman and gives you the sword after the fight. Not sure if this is Knight's honor, or treason to the Gadal Empire, or a glitch in the system. I can't wait to see the patch notes on his latest firmware update after this. Axel Gear, the Black Knight, is the penultimate boss once again. He has all your moves and abilities, and has been a pain in your ass for two games straight. We're past the point of arguing, and we're definitely past the point of Jaeger boxing. Now we finally get a proper sword fight, but not like the one in Rocket Knight. That one doesn't count. Now he does some kind of spell to make the electric walls close in. Depending on what difficulty you pick, the walls close in at different speeds. They don't close in all the way, but trying to fight this dude in this extremely narrow space is just about as much fun as it sounds. The game doesn't exactly do a very good job at trying to keep Axel on screen, so you might get blindsided because of it. But you can't have a jetpack sword fight in the cramped space either. You just have to take the good with the bad. Once you get used to Sparky's iframes and his dash attacks, and strike when Axel is open, you'll be kicking his ass in no time. If there is one trope I love in gaming, that I will defend with honor, is the boss fight that's basically a mirror match. Fighting a dude that is basically you. Devil May Cry did it, God Hand did it, Bayonetta did it, 
Zelda did it, Rocket Knight did it, and so did Sparkster. Axel drops the last of the seven swords, and depending on whether or not you've been collecting the other six swords, he gets his gold armor and rescues the princess. Alright, we still have to fight this asshole. The final boss of Sparkster does not disappoint. Gidal may not be anywhere near as persistent as Devil Guess in the last game, but he makes up for it with tons of sorcery and magic bullshit. He'll fill the stage with lightning, meteor showers, and this awesome move where he does a Captain Ginyu and swaps bodies with you. Now you play as the king and you have to fight the possum until you swap bodies again. A good pro tip would be to use Sparkster's neutral spin dash to avoid projectiles. I've never seen a possum with more abusable iframes in my life. I'm sure they exist, but this is ridiculous. The final boss is awesome. The Yamaha 2612 goes haywire during these attacks and I love it. But the lightning attacks should have a better solution than standing still for most of it. And the gold armor makes quick work of Gadol should you pursue that route. And I feel like you only get the trial version of the full fight if you do. But you still get to fight a second form. And here's another pro tip for you. Don't die. Guess where the game puts you when you die? The start of the second form? Nope. How about the start of the first form? Nope. How about the fight with Axel? Yep. It's so goddamn stupid. You have to fight both Axel and Gadol's two forms in one go. And granted, these aren't the hardest fights in the world, and the game fills your health before Gadol. But I just want to know whose ass I'm gonna kick first when I crash through Konami's office window for this stupid checkpoint bullshit. After you dodge his eye lasers and stab his weak spot a bunch of times, Sparky makes damn sure he never comes back again. Now watch him come back as two cyborgs like Destroy Man. We did it. We saved Elhorn survived the epilepsy-inducing screen, and rescued the princess's cousin. Sparky tells the princess, fuck your stupid cake, and blasts off. Then we get the credits, and we actually didn't get a now try hard mode ending. Or worse, see you again at Axel A2. I felt that in my soul. And speaking of the credits, a lot of people who worked on Contra Hardcore worked on Sparkster, and they also worked on Rocket Knight. No surprise, really, they're all Konami games. You wouldn't know because of the stupid nicknames. They were both produced by the same guy, Tomikazu Kirita, a supervisor for games like God of War 3 and Ghosts of Sparta, as well as Shadows of the Colossus. Names like Akira Soji, Akira Yamaoka, and even Michiru Yamane show up here. All composers I brought up in my hardcore video, this time with Osamu Kasai, who was a sound programmer turned senior producer for games like Rumble Roses and Gradius V. And the music here gets shared with the Super Nintendo version. But there are some songs I prefer on the Genesis, and some songs I prefer on the Super Nintendo. The Genesis has that punch and that grittiness that just can't be duplicated. And the Super Nintendo's SPC capabilities allow for a wider variety of instruments and sounds. The symphonic sounds really add a new sheen of consummate professionalism that really gives some of these songs a big boost. Sorry, I, I start sounding like Patrick Bateman when I talk about video game music. The Genesis sounds insane at times. Double kick drums, loud and dirty bass lines and synths. Just listen to the low end. Get your subwoofers ready for this one. The Super Nintendo music doesn't have the intensity of the Genesis, but it gets serious when it needs to be, and it can be pretty chill at times. But that password music from the Genesis version is too damn good. Each system plays to its strengths. It doesn't try to imitate the Super Nintendo version, but it makes each song its own instead. The Kukieha Club knew what they were doing. And one more cool tidbit for you, you can actually play this game, and many others, on the internet archive on your browser. It's neat, but I probably wouldn't do it. Sparkster had a lot of talent behind it. Even if the staff at Konami was divided between two teams for each version of the game, they're two completely different teams with a few people getting credits for both games. 
I don't know what the fuck a super programmer is. Or an ultra programmer. There's no super programmer in the Super Nintendo version. You know, the console where a super programmer would make the most sense. Whatever. Sparkster is still a fun game, but for every step forward, it takes one or two steps back. Maybe because Rocket Knight set the bar so high that making a better game was out of the question. It's one of the best platformers that Konami ever put out. As for Sparkster, the gameplay is solid. The graphics, while still good for Genesis standards, I don't know, I just feel like the last game looked better. There's a great variety of levels here, but some of them become a slog to get through due to tedious design or just complete bullshit. I don't need to fight the same mini-boss three times, and I don't need slow scrolling sections or a slow ceiling collapsing section either. You have a cool gimmick in Sparkster and its jetpack. Make your levels around your character's gimmick. For example, nobody likes Labyrinth Zone in Sonic 1. It goes against everything the Hedgehog is about. Speed is Sonic's strength, not drowning to death in slow motion. And you will also get a few deaths because the damn possum goes apeshit when you bounce off the walls. Especially when you're in a narrow space, or the ceiling is chasing your ass. But the worst thing about Sparkster is Konami's handling of the difficulty in the North American version. Without a doubt. Avoid the gems at all costs because they serve to piss you off. But despite all my criticisms, it's a game about a fucking jetpack marsupial with a sword and giant mecha boxing. I don't know what you people were smoking when you came up with this shit, but give these people promotions. And also pass that shit because I want some too. For medicinal purposes, of course. So that's it. Sparkster on the Genesis. I'll do the Super Nintendo version in a later video, and we'll see which team did the better job. I intended for them to be part of the same video, but this one has gone on long enough. I go on a long tangent sometimes. I really need to put less effort in my videos. Anyway, I'll see you all there. And before anyone tries to correct me and say, it's actually an opossum, I really don't give a fuck. <laughs>